Hi, this is Brian Kim. I'm going to share with you a Yamani technique and a sewing machine iridodialysis suture repair. So this is a patient referred to me. The patient was aphagic and also had an iridodialysis uh, along the temporal aspect of the eye. And so the plan was to do Yamani technique as well as the sewing machine iridodialysis repair. So every good surgery starts with good preparation. I'm making my incisions. Again, slightly supratemporal and supranasal. This is my um, inferior incision to externalize the leading haptic, and this is my incision for my AC maintainer. So I am sitting superior temporally to do the surgery. I'm preparing my needles now. This is a right needle, and I'm bending it about 70, 80 degrees, and the bevel is facing towards me for the right needle. Now this is the left needle. The left needle is going to face away from me, and again, it's bent about 70 to 80 degrees. Here, I'm filling the eye with some dispersive viscoelastic, and then I'm using calipers to mark about two and a half millimeters posterior to the limbus here. And then I'm using the tip of a cannula to help me mark. This seems to help with creating a very nice and distinct round mark. Make sure the conjunctiva is dry before you ink mark. And then I'm gonna mark here two millimeters adjacent to the initial mark. I'm using an axis ring to help mark and guide me 180 degrees apart from the original marks. To ensure good centration of the lens, I'm using caliper and then using the cannula to ink 2.5 millimeters back and then 2 millimeters adjacent to this mark. Here I'm making my 3 millimeter keratome incision, which is 90 degrees away from the markings. This is going to be uh, the CT Lucia 602 lens. It's being injected and being pushed my, by my surgical assistant. As she's advancing the IOL, I'm going to pull the leading haptic out of the inferior corneal incision. This helps to make sure the lens doesn't fall, but it also helps keep the lens in a more anterior position, and it gives me better access for the trailing haptic. So I'm filling the eye with dispersive viscoelastic, and then I'm placing the right needle through the ink mark, tunneling two millimeters before diving into the anterior chamber. Uh, now you can see the needle. I'm gonna grab the haptic right at the apex of the U, and then I'm sliding the haptic into the needle. Again, pay attention that the, the needle has a docking platform, which I can use to help guide me to the syringe is then disengaged from the needle and uh, intraocular 23 gauge forceps are then used to grab the leading haptic and pull it into the eye. Forceps are then used to uh, grasp the leading haptic. Again, the needle bevel is facing away and I'm using the the curvature of the haptic to dock the needle. And then as I do that, I flatten the haptic and then it glides right into the lumen of the needle. And so this is a trick. You wanna make sure that the curvature of the haptic faces the approach of the bevel platform. So the needle is then slowly pulled out. And as it is, um, McPherson forceps are used to grasp the haptic being externalized. And then cotter is used to create a small bulb at the tip. The similar procedure is performed for the right needle. As the needle is being pulled out, uh, the forceps are ready to grasp the haptic, and then cotter is used to create that bulb. The haptics are then internalized through the conjunctiva and uh, placed flush to the sclera. And then a temporal pruritomy is performed. Attention is drawn to the iridodialysis, which we're going to do the, again, the sewing machine technique. After the pyridomy, cotter is used for hemostasis, and then a partial thickness scleral groove is created, approximately 1.5 millimeters posterior to the limbus. A tenoproline suture is then threaded through the lumen of a 26 gauge needle. It, could, it has to be about one and a half millimeters long. And again, the gauge of the needle is not as important as long as the suture can thread through the, through the needle itself. So for more detail about the sewing machine iridodialysis suture technique, I would suggest going online and finding some resources. But essentially, you're going to stab that needle through the peripheral iris, and then you're going to emerge with the needle external through that scleral groove. You're going to grab the suture and externalize that suture as much as you can. And then um, while after holding the suture, you're going to internalize the needle again and then you will go adjacent to that spot, pierce the adjacent iris, 
and then puncture through the scleral groove again. And when you do that, you're gonna grab some more suture that's within the lumen of the needle. And then you're gonna repeat that same step a few more times as you march across the iridodialysis. And again, you're going through that scleral groove each time. Again, I'm stabbing the iris here. You're gonna emerge into the scleral groove with the needle. You're gonna grab with the McPherson forceps the portion of suture that is right there, that little loop of suture, you're gonna grab it uh, and hold it as you pull the, the needle back inside the eye, you're grabbing the adjacent iris and then again, stabbing it through the scleral groove. And you're going, you're doing this um, along the incision because this parallels exactly where the iridodialysis is. And essentially, once you have this done across the, the groove and across the iridodialysis, you'll pull the needle out of the eye, but ensuring that the, uh, the sutures are intact. And then you're going to cut the loops of the suture. And by cutting the loops of the suture, this enables you to use the free ends of those sutures and then tie the suture to the adjacent suture to itself. So again, you're not tying to the loop because then the suture would just slide back into the wound. What you're going to do is you're going to tie the suture free end to the adjacent suture free end. And by doing so, this harnesses the peripheral iris and secures it to the scleral wall. After you do that, you want to trim the tips. And if you can, you try to bury the knots as much as possible into the groove. But again, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge to do that. And so that's what the groove is there for. That groove helps protect the proline suture from degrading. The only thing I would have done differently here is when I grab the suture after I stab the needle and externalize it through the scleral groove, I would have given myself a lot more suture to work with because I had smaller loops. It was a little bit more of a challenge to uh, make those throws. And so that would be a tip for the future to make sure you have as a long enough suture with each pass so that when you cut them you'll have a lot more suture to work with. I'm then closing the conjunctiva with some adovarical suture and then I'm using some micrograspers to kind of tease that iris. The iris when it's been traumatized like that tends to be a little bit different than normal iris and so you want to make sure that the suture rounds out nicely, make sure there's not any iris that's incarcerated or bunched up and so with just some gentle pressure, I'm just grabbing that uh, iris on the temporal side again, making sure it rounds out nicely. Put a tenonalon suture through the main incision and I bury the knot, and then I'm gonna put some subconjunctival uh, ANSEF. So this is a demonstration of the Amani technique as well as the sewing machine iridodialysis repair. Dr. Ravi Kumar is the one that invented it. I think it's an ingenious technique. It was an elegant and straightforward procedure. And I hope this was helpful to you. Thank you for your attention.